Hello, everyone. It's me, Hello, Feather. Today, I'm going to talk to you about a game series called Portal. Portal is superbly written and versatile. It can be a hilarious puzzle game. And at the same time, an incredibly tragic story. It is layered with metaphors and immaculate character development. If you've been with me for a while, you know that Portal is one of my favorite, 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 favorite game series. And I regard it as one of the most brilliant games ever made, with the greatest video game villain of all time. My Reddit handle is Sailor Jill. It's kind of like a mini tribute to Sailor Moon and Portal. If you haven't played the game, please do not fret. I'm going to tell you the story first, and then explore the metaphors. It's important to note that my explorations are my interpretations of events in Portal, and that there are loads of theories out there about the games. I could be wrong. I could be right. I don't know for sure, but I do know that I love these games. So, let's get started. The main characters of Portal are as follows. Chell, Gladys, and Weekly. There are also characters that we never technically meet, as described in the game, but are referenced throughout the games and are crucial to the plot. They are Gabe Johnson, Carolyn, and Doug Ratman. Additionally, there are two alternates one can play as in Portal 2, and they are Atlas and Peabody. In the games, you play as Chell, a silent female protagonist. Chell wakes up in a relaxation vault and is briefed by the voice of Gladys, an artificial intelligence who informs her that she is a test subject for Aperture Sciences research program. Throughout the game, Chell completes tests in the form of puzzles, and she acquires a few things. Number one, a portal gun that shoots blue and orange portals to travel through. Number two, advanced knee replacement components which are replaced with the long fall boots in Portal 2, both of which keep Chell from shattering when she falls or jumps from, uh, at times, very staggering heights. Number three, a companion cube. A companion cube is a bulky box with a heart on it that Chell uses to complete some of the tests. In return for her diligence as a test subject, Gladys tells Chell that she will be rewarded with a cake once all test chambers are completed. As the game progresses, Chell finds areas with graffiti murals and Warnings scribbled all over the walls. Number 
in little dens throughout Aperture Science where it looks like someone has been living. The writing on the walls relay messages like Help. The kick is a lie. And she's watching you. These scrawls and dents or the handiwork of Doug Ratman, a tragic character who was a scientist at the Aperture Science Enrichment Center. Prior to the events of Chell's Awakening, Gladys flooded the entire facility with neurotoxin on Bring Your Daughter to Work Day. Ratman survived. He was also a paranoid schizophrenic, and he was dependent on antipsychotic medication as a means of keeping him sane. His sanity was something that Gladys enjoyed playing with, often trying to convince him that everything that was happening was a projection or manifestation of his paranoia. His only friend was a companion cube. And through the fossils of art that he left on the walls, uh, you come to understand that Doug Ramen cared a great deal for the lifeless box and regarded it in a similar way that Tom Hanks regarded the volleyball Wilson in the movie Castaway. Ratman found Jill's file. And it said that she could not be tested, as she is abnormally stubborn and quote never gives up. Ever. Ratman is convinced that Chell will defeat Gladys, and he moves her to the top of the test subjects so that she will be the first to be picked for the next round of testing. His sanity ebbs away, but in the midst of his madness, he leaves clues and warnings all over the facility to help point Chell in the right direction. Ratman's warnings to Chell are eventually revealed to be correct, and Gladys attempts to murder Chell. At the end of the game, Chell battles Gladys by detaching Gladys's personality cores and placing them into an emergency intelligence incinerator. One by one, Jell destroys the morality core, curiosity core, geek core, and anger core. Gladys's generators trigger a gravitational vortex, destroying Gladys and placing Jell outside of Aperture Science. Jell awakens in the parking lot of the Enrichment Center with a lifeless Gladys beside her. However, the party escort bot thanks her for assuming the party escort submission position and begins dragging her back into the now ruined Aperture Science facility as Chell is being dragged away. It is revealed that the destruction of the central core, which turns out to be Gladys, triggers the automatic activation of the other personality cores who begin their assigned roles in Aperture. That's the end of Portal 1. Portal 2 begins 
very much like the first game. Chell wakes up in a relaxation chamber, which has the appearance of a motel room, for a mandatory physical and mental wellness exercise. A pre-recorded message tells Chell that she's been asleep for an indiscernible amount of time, and warns of an imminent core explosion. We are then introduced to a personality core named Wheatley. He is a very friendly, sort of spastic, and immediately lovable artificial intelligence. Completely warns Chell of the likelihood of her having serious brain damage, and then he laments about having to take care of 10,000 test subjects. He works with Chell to try to escape the testing center. They make their way to Gladys's chamber, which is overgrown with a lot of plant life which signifies that a lot of time has passed between the two games. In the middle of the chamber lies the lifeless body of Gladys. Lately, inadvertently reboots Gladys, and Gladys utters a very frightening, Oh, it's you. It's been a long time. How have you been? I've been really busy being dead. You know, after you murdered me. We both said a lot of things you're going to regret, but I think we can put our differences behind us. For science, you monster. And then Gladys tosses Wheatley and drops Chell deep, 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 deep into Aperture Science. As per Gladys's instructions, Chell retrieves the portal gun again. And Chell begins testing once more. Gladys frequently taunts Chell and remarks that she had to relive her own murder over and over. Wheatley survived the encounter with Gladys and secretly asks Chell to continue testing while he finds a means of escape. Eventually, he and Chell make a break for it. Along the way, they pass the Potato Power Exhibition. Held on Bring Your Daughter to Work Day, which is the day that Gladys flooded the facility with neurotoxin and killed everyone. Well, killed almost everyone, aside from those that she imprisoned to become test subjects. One of the projects has remarkable growth, and it has Chell's childhood signature on it, confirming that Chell is the daughter of an Aperture Science employee. Wheatley and Chell make their way to Gladys's location, and there's a big showdown. The game informs you that Gladys is partially corrupt, and because Wheatley is present, a core transfer is initialized. This requires both cores approval, and when Gladys objects, a stalemate is reached. Associate is required to press a stalemate resolution button for the core transfer to occur. Gladys desperately protests, but Chell initializes the transfer, and Wheatley is transferred into Gladys's body. He starts to send Chell on her way up to the surface. He becomes overwhelmed with the power that he wields, 
and he pulls Jill back into the facility, calling her selfish, and saying that she sacrificed nothing to get there. He tells her that he is the boss, and then he places Gladys into a potato battery against her will. Gladys, who I will now call Potatoes, I did not make that up, reveals that Wheatley was designed to be a moron in order to dampen her brain power so that she wouldn't attempt to murder everyone in the facility. Enraged, Wheatley throws potatoes and gel into an elevator shaft where the two plunge down, 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 deep into the bowels of after science. After the fall, Potatoes is being abducted by a crow. And Chell explores and a voice recording starts to play welcoming the visitor to Aperture. The speaker is Cave Johnson, founder and CEO of Aperture. Cave introduces his secretary. Her name is Carolyn. Cave Johnson guides the player through the tests while gradually revealing the history behind Aperture Science. Cave Johnson founded the company in the 1950s as a curtains manufacturer, becoming a self-made billionaire and expanding into a science research company. Cave slowly runs the company into the ground, and it is revealed that in the 1980s, he buys 70 million dollars worth of moon rocks to grind up, and the result was toxic. Cave Johnson falls gravely ill. Chell finds potatoes in a bird's nest, and suddenly Potatoes and Chell are a team who are set on stopping Wheatley before he destroys Aperture with them inside. Chell and Potatoes come across a portrait of Cave Johnson and Carolyn, and potatoes from works, but they are both really familiar to her. She then begins reliving the conversation between Carolyn and Cave, almost as if she can't stop herself. Potatoes becomes distressed, and temporarily shuts off. Cave Johnson's voice on the recordings is growing weaker, as he is closer and closer to death with each recording. In one of the recordings, he instructs his engineers to start research into artificial intelligence so that his mind can be transferred into a computer to ensure his survival. He instructs his employees that if he should die, before the AI is complete, Carolyn is to take charge of the facility against her wishes. He also informs them that she can take his place in the AI against her will. And this is the quote. Now she'll argue. She'll say she can't. She's modest like No more recordings by Cave are played, and it is implied that Carolyn is forced into the AI, possibly murdered, and Gladys is born. This is a huge moment in the game, and after the revelation, Potatoes becomes more of an ally. She praises and encourages Chell. She even defends Chell. From Wheatley's jabs, jabs that she had once thrown at Jill. Jill's greatest enemy becomes.
becomes more and potatoes eventually end up in another showdown with Wheatley, who forces them to carry out his tests, revealing the need to test with an itch hardwired into the AI system. He hints that he has found other test subjects. He tries to kill Chell and Potatoes, but they escape. Potatoes comes up with a plan to dethrone Wheatley. Chell makes her way back to Wheatley's lair for the final confrontation, where he reveals that the facility will self-destruct in six minutos. Chell and Wheatley battle, while Gladys inserts herself as the substitute cooler. Chell tries to press the stalemate resolution button. But Wheatley booby trapped the button and it explodes. With the last of her strength, Chell grabs the portal gun and shoots a portal at the moon, causing everything in the room to be sucked into the vacuum of space. But Chell manages to hang on by grabbing a hold of Wheatley. Gladys uses a mechanical arm to detach Wheatley from his body, and he is then sucked into space. She then pulls Chell back through the portal into Aperture Science before closing the portal. Chell wakes up later to find a worried Peabody and Atlas, who are two mobile robots, watching over her and Gladys is back in her body. Gladys thanks Chell for helping her realize that Carolyn is a part of her. And then she proceeds to delete what's left of Carolyn. However, instead of killing Chell, she says that the best solution is the easiest one. And killing you is hard. She sends Chell up an elevator, where along the way she is serenaded by a turret opera. When she reaches the top, Chell steps out into a beautiful field. The door to Aperture opens behind her, and Gladys throws the companion cube out to be with the now free Chell. The game ends with a regretful Wheatley floating in space. So that's the basic story. The first game was funny, the second game was hilarious, but both games also break my heart. Gladys is the violated and possibly murdered Carolyn, a woman who loved science and was forced to become a science experiment who then forces everyone to become her test subjects. <laughs> Gladys is the OG of throwing shade with quips like, remember before when I was talking about smelly garbage standing around being useless? That was a metaphor. I was actually talking about you, and I'm sorry. You didn't right over your head, which would have made this apology seem insane. That's why I had to call you garbage a second time just now. However, if you look at her lines without the snark, some of them are very sad and very revealing. I'm going to recite some of Gladys's lines not going to do an impression of them. I'm going to read them in the context I interpret them in. Remember, Carolyn is a part of Gladys, whether she knows it or not. Here are some instances where Carolyn 
could be talking to Gladys. Excellent. You're a predator and these tests are your prey. Speaking of which, I was researching sharks for an upcoming test. Do you know who else murders people who are only trying to help them? Did you guess sharks? <laughs> because that's wrong. The correct answer is nobody. Nobody but you is that pointlessly cruel. She says it to Cho, but this could easily be applicable to Kate. He made the tests, one of which turned Carolyn into prey. And he did murder her, and she was just trying to help him. Gladys is exacting Carolyn's revenge through every test subject. And in the context of her speaking these taunts, it isn't hard to imagine how gratifying it might be for poor Carolyn to say to those who made her the way she is. Here's another. Do you know what my days used to be like? I just tested. Nobody murdered me, or put me in a potato, or fed me to birds. I had a pretty good life. This is incredibly sad, because that was Carolyn, a woman devoted to science, who loved her job. She had a pretty good life. One line that I think is very clever is what Gladys says to Chell after establishing Chell as her murderer. She says, You know, if you had done that to somebody else, they might devote their entire existence to exacting revenge. It's implied that the scientists at Aperture did murder Carolyn. Whether or not she knows it, Gladys has devoted her existence to revenge. She killed the scientists with neurotoxins, and made everyone else imprisoned slaves for her to play with until the time of their deaths. Her bloodlust is almost a reciprocal gesture. They killed her for science. Now, she's doing the same to them. She's the predator now. And these tests are her prey. Early in Portal 2, we can hear what could have been the demise of Carolyn when Gladys is forcibly removed from her body by Wheatley and Jell. Before the transfer, Wheatley asks, What if it hurts? What if this really hurts? And Gladys replies, Oh, it will. Believe me, it will. It's not a snarky remark. It's one of the few straightforward truths that Gladys says in the game. She then cries out, fearful and anguished. Get your hands off me. No, stop. No, 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 no. While she was protesting the transfer. Those cries could have been the echoes of Carolyn as she was being forcibly removed from her human body to be placed into Gladys. It's a very disturbing set of lines when viewed in that context. Another line she says is, This isn't brave. It's murder. What did I ever do to you? Gladys asks this of Chell during their confrontation. It's certainly applicable to the moment, but it can also be applicable to the past. If you subscribe to the idea that Gladys is Carolyn's revenge, then the steady stream of snarky comments she produces makes more sense. Gladys gets satisfaction from emotionally harming her test subject. There is no scientific need 
to make the test subjects feel inadequate or unworthy. Yet Gladys does it. And she delights in it. She dark pronks all over the place, perhaps because of the gratification that she gets from hurting those who hurt her. One theory suggests that Gladys is Chell's mother, and I personally believe that to be true. Some people think that Chell is a clone or an android created by Gladys, but I think Chell was either birthed or adopted by Carolyn. There are lots of mother-daughter dynamics throughout the game that suggest that's the relationship they either had or developed. Was Chell adopted as a child by Carolyn? Or was she adopted by Gladys in a more metaphorical way? I can't say for certain, but here are some lines and instances I noticed that support the idea in my eyes. Well done. Remember, the Aperture Science Bring Your Daughter to Work Day is the perfect time to have her tested. We know that that was a fateful day in the past, but instead of looking at it as a reference to Gladys's rise to power, we can also look at it as a hint about the present. If Chell is Carolyn's daughter, then any day where she is conscious in the facility is take your daughter to work day. Furthermore, Gladys uses Chell to test. She's literally having her tested in the present on take your daughter to work day. In portal one, Gladys gives you a companion cube to carry around before ordering you to destroy it. There are theories about companion cubes, including some that say the bodies of test subjects that have perished are stored inside them, which is pretty gruesome. But I like to look at the cube as a metaphor. I subscribe to the theory that Gladys and Chell are connected by a mother and child bond. And I believe that Gladys doesn't remember being Carolyn until Portal 2. But I think that Carolyn's echoes speak through Gladys. I believe a lot of foreshadowing happens through the companion cube. The companion cube is a big box with a heart on it, with a pink heart on it. Gladys symbolically gives Chell her heart and then teaches her how to destroy it. I think that Carolyn never wanted to be Gladys and that she still doesn't want to be Gladys. I believe that some part of her knows who Chell is, and she thinks Chell will be able to free her. Gladys prepares Chell for a future without her. She teaches her how to navigate Aperture Science, and provides her with tools and resources succeed. And she wants Chell to eventually leave home in the form of Aperture and live an independent and emancipated life. If you view some of her lines from Portal 1 while looking through this theory's eyes, the humor is quickly replaced by sadness and sacrifice. Here are some lines to support that hypothesis. 
first one. Rest assured that an independent panel of ethicists has absolved the Enrichment Center, Aperture Science employees, and all test subjects of any moral responsibility for the companion Q euthanizing process. Gladys is telling Cho it's okay to kill the cube. But remember, we are looking at the cube as if it represents Gladys. Gladys is Chell's real companion through both games. She is telling Chell that it's okay for her to kill her and that it isn't her fault. Next line. While it has been a faithful companion, your companion cube cannot accompany you through the rest of the test. If it could talk, and the Enrichment Center takes this opportunity to remind you that it cannot, it would tell you to go on without it, because it would rather die in a fire than become a burden to you. If this isn't foreshadowing, I don't know what is. Because later in the game, Chell goes on to face Gladys and she wins by tearing her into pieces and throwing her into an incinerator. But look at that last line. Go on without it because it would rather die in a fire than become a burden to you. How many parents or caretakers can relate to feeling that way. <laughs> Maybe not so much the dying in a fire part, but wanting to never be a burden to their children. Gladys is telling Chell, I can't live like this. I want you to carry on without me because I want a better life for you. Next line. Although the euthanizing process is remarkably painful, eight out of ten aperture science engineers believe that the companion cube is most likely incapable of feeling much pain. Gladys is telling her that the situation is going to hurt, but she, Carolyn, since the cube has the heart and the heart of Gladys is Carolyn, can no longer actually feel that pain. She is telling Chell not to feel guilty and to not be afraid of setting her free. And then there's this line. Please escort your companion cube to the Aperture Science Emergency Intelligence incinerator. She's flat out telling Chell to bring her to the emergency intelligence incinerator. But she says the word escort. It's different than saying carry a box to the trash. It's saying we'll go together. And here's another. The companion cube cannot continue through the testing. State and local statutory regulations prohibit it from simply remaining here alone and companionless. You must euthanize it. Carolyn is saying, please don't leave me alone here like this forever. She is saying, please kill me. At the end of the first game, a song called Still Alive plays. It is sung by Gladys, and it's, <laughs> it's full of backsass. But, like the other lines, I would like you to take the snark out of the words and imagine it is being communicated by an immortal prisoner. So I'm going to try to read it in the way I think it's meant instead of the way it 
is delivered in the game. But there's no sense crying over every mistake. You just keep on trying till you run out of cake. And the science gets done, and you make a neat gun for people who are still alive. This stanza is very vengeful. Cake is supposed to be a reward for the test subjects, but we know the cake is a lie. However, in this case, the cake is a metaphor for Carolyn's revenge. It's her reward for becoming Gladys. And she gets to eat it every time she kills a test subject. Also, the people who are still alive not be referring to mankind in general, but to the people who are still alive and imprisoned in Aperture. Next stanza. Go ahead, leave me. I think I prefer to stay inside. Maybe you'll find someone else to help you. Maybe Black Mesa. chance. Anyway, this cake is great. It's so delicious and moist. This stanza is sad. Carolyn is still immortal and trapped inside Gladys. She doesn't prefer to stay inside. She has no choice. She's a prisoner. The cake she's bragging about eating is a lie, just like her autonomy is. But her revenge is delicious. Next stanza. And believe me, I'm still alive. I'm doing science, and I'm still alive. that we know about Carolyn's possible murder, betrayal, and imprisonment, in addition to theories that she actually wanted Chell to kill her. This stanza is rather heart-wrenching. There's a saying that no parent ever wants to outlive their children. Gladys isn't celebrating her immortality. She's mourning it. There are theories that Chell is the daughter of Cave and Carolyn. Some of the supports to this theory include that all three have names that start with C. Um, there's a portrait of Carolyn standing behind Cave and in real life, it would be highly unusual for an executive to have a massive portrait of himself and his assistant. It would be more likely that he would have a portrait of himself and a wife or significant other when the portrait was commissioned. Um, in the game, he asks, through the recordings for Carolyn to bring him pain pills, which imply that she was also some sort of caretaker for him. Gladys repeatedly makes reference to Chell being adopted, and even says that there are two people in storage who share Chell's last name. I can't confirm that Chell is their adopted child? But I assert that Gladys is their metaphorical child, a product of their union. Cave tells his scientists to put Carolyn into his computer against her will. In Cave's own words, Carolyn was married to science, something that he seemed to admire. 
However, Cave was not a fan of safe science. He says, science isn't about why, it's about why not. Why is so much of our science dangerous? Why not marry safe science if you love it so much? One could argue that Cave was married to testing because he invented bizarre tests test that put the subjects through torturous experiments for seemingly no reason aside from that he could. Aperture's motto was, we do what we must because we can. He says in one of the recordings, ha, I like your style. You make up your own rules. Just like me. Aperture Science's motto was, we do what we must because we can. Carolyn's scientific mind, combined with Cave's overly ambitious and apathetic one, combined in Cave's computer to form Gladys, an AI with Carolyn's thirst for knowledge and Cave's thirst for testing, and it's set on avenging a woman it can't recall being. So the AI destroys those who destroyed Carolyn, and the rest become the death subjects. Another line that Cave says in the recordings is, Your test assignment will vary depending on the matter you have been to the world, do your will. Cave says this in a pre-recorded segment to be played to Aperture test subjects. However, since Carolyn becomes a test subject, her assignment, or her present obligation, to Aperture Science has been bending her world to her will. Even though I believe Gladys is a mixture of Carolyn's mind and Cave's insanity. I believe that Carolyn shows herself from time to time through the lines that Gladys speaks. There's a quote by Cave Johnson in Portal 2 that is wildly popular. You might have seen it. It sparked a lot of memes. Um, art videos and songs. It's called The Lemon Speech. I personally find it very inspiring and motivating. I even have little lemon jewelry in honor of it. The quote is as follows. When life gives you lemons, don't make lemonade. Make life take the lemons back. Get mad. I don't want your lemons. What am I supposed to do with these? Demand to see life's manager. Make life rue the day it thought it could give Cave Johnson lemons. Do you know who I am? I'm the man who's going to burn your house down with the lemons. I'm going to get my engineers to invent a combustible lemon that burns your house down. It's, it's really funny, and it, it can be very inspiring, but in the context of the game, it's also Carolyn's revenge. When Gladys hears the pre-recorded lemon speech, she gets giddy with excitement and bloodlust. She agrees with his sentiment, but it's important to note what she says and in what order she says it. She says, burn his house down. His house. She gives life a male pronoun. Why? Because
because she holds Cave responsible for her death and she wants revenge on his house. Aperture science. Then she says, burning people. He says what we're all thinking. We know that Gladys has killed others' test subjects and has tried to kill Chell by burning her in the first game. Gladys is expressing joy hearing Cave's voice parrot her own vengeful tendencies. Tendencies she doesn't realize she got directly from him. Earlier in the game, we hear Cave tell the then-human Carolyn to say goodbye, to which Carolyn playfully retorts, Goodbye, Carolyn. However, at the end of the pre-recorded lament speech, Gladys says, Goodbye, sir. It could be Carolyn reflexively and politely saying goodbye to her boss's voice. Or, it could be that Carolyn turned Gladys, saying a cold goodbye to the man she holds responsible for her death, right before she follows his advice. Life gives Carolyn lemons, in the form of her murder and imprisonment, as Gladys. Do you know who she is? She's the woman who burns Cave Johnson's house down with the lemons. Or, in her case, neurotoxin. She follows her mentor's advice. And she gets mad. Furthermore, towards the end of the game, there's more evidence to suggest Gladys understands revenge well. As her memories of Carolyn come back, she understands her motives for revenge, too. Here's a quote from Potatoes. I know things look bleak, but that crazy man down there was right. Let's not take these lemons. We are going to march right back upstairs and make him put me back in my body. I do not think it is a coincidence that Gladys becomes our ally and a sympathetic figure. We carry our companion who has been displaced from her body, and in doing so, we watch how painful it is for her to see Wheatley destroy the facility she loved and built, and we see her violently ripped from her body and placed unwillingly into another. We are seeing Carolyn's story being replayed before us through new events. And because she is our companion, we get to see her rationale in her decision making. She wants to fight to get her body back. She says, let's get mad. If we are going to explode, let's at least explode with some dignity. And then she wants the person who stole her freedom to die. She says, After seeing what he's done to my facility, after we take it over again, is it alright if I kill him? When speaking to Chell about plans, she had to kill her. She says, It wasn't anything personal, just, you know, you did kill me. Fair's fair. This reinforces my belief that killing and enslaving the scientists was another instance of Gladys's interpretation of fairness. And that in her eyes, she isn't doing anything wrong. She's reciprocating. 
When Chell and Wheat Lee wake Gladys up in Portal 2, she says, It's been a long time. How have you been? I've been really busy being dead. You know, after you murdered me, we both said a lot of things that you're going to regret. But I think we can put our differences behind us. For science. You monster. Obviously, this can refer to the events in Portal 1. But what if it also pertains to events before the games? Perhaps Gladys views every human in the facility as accomplices to Carolyn's murder. If viewed in that context, the line, I think we can put our differences behind us for science, you monster, explains Gladys's rationale for enslaving the people in Aperture and using them as test subjects. A more obvious example comes later, when Gladys tries to motivate Chell by saying, Look, even if you think we're still enemies, we're enemies with a common interest. Revenge. You like revenge, right? Everybody likes revenge. Well, let's go get some. This is another instance where Gladys is talking about Wheatley, but the conversation could easily be applied to Carolyn speaking about Cave. She says, It didn't matter to me. I was in it for the science. Him, though. If he's not getting his solution euphoria, we could be in a lot of trouble. I believe this also supports the idea that Gladys exists as a mixture of Carolyn and Cave. Wheatley is corrupted by the Cave parts that exist in the Aperture AI, making him homicidal, power hungry, and willing to perform any kind of experiment, no matter the detriment to the test subjects. Meanwhile, the longer we are paired with potatoes, we see a mellowing occurring, which turns into introspection and empathy. Potatoes becomes more and more connected to Carolyn's inclinations, while Wheatley becomes more connected. Gladys says, Carolyn, why do I know this woman? Did I kill her, or... The scientists were always hanging cores on me to regulate my behavior. I've heard voices all my life, but now I hear the voice of a conscience, and it's terrifying, because for the first time, it's my voice. She realizes she's Carolyn. She realizes how she's been violated. And she realizes what she's done. There are numerous reasons I believe Chell is Carolyn's daughter. Or adopted daughter. In the first game, there are parent-child themes being played out that are very hard to overlook. A parent brings a child into the world and is supposed to prepare them for the future through lessons and tools. Gladys wakes Chell, teaches her how to survive, and gives her the portal gun. There are also a lot of exchanges that are common to mother-daughter relationships. Gladys praises Chell throughout the game, congratulating her efforts and encouraging her, and even gives her a companion cube. Much like a mother gives a child a teddy bear. She starts out with a lot of positive reinforcement, and it is only when Chell becomes defiant 
then the relationship turns into empty threats, pleading, and passive aggression. Sort of like what can happen during the teenage years when parents become distressed that they can no longer control a child. Gladys states, you're not smart, you're not a scientist, you're not a doctor, you're not even a full-time employee. Where did your life go so wrong? She's indicating that Chell is different. It sounds like a jab, but it's a hint about Chell's identity. Gladys is telling us that Chell does not belong in the facility. Another support comes from the turret opera, when the turrets sing to Chell as she descends out of the facility. The turrets things that tried to kill Chell throughout the game are now serenading her with Italian words that translate to Oh my dear, farewell. My dear child, why don't you walk far away, far away from science? My dear baby, my dear, dear baby, my beloved, my dear, my dear, my little girl, Oh dear, my dear. Furthermore, when looking at the lyrics to the song, Want You Gone, in the context of a mother speaking to her child, the song becomes mournful. Gladys sings, You want your freedom. Take it. That's what I'm counting on. I used to want you dead. Now I only want you gone. She is counting on Chell's desire to escape, to keep her away from Aperture. She doesn't want her gone because she doesn't like her. She wants her gone because she loves her. She sings, she was a lot like you. Maybe not quite as heavy, but now little Carolyn is in here too. Carolyn has always been there. She just didn't realize it. Now that she knows, she has to learn how to reconcile those memories. She proceeds. One day they woke me up so I could live forever. It's such a shame the same will never happen to you. You've got your short, sad, Life left. That's what I'm counting on. I'll let you get right to it. She doesn't really mean that it's a shame that Chell is mortal. She is grateful for her mortality, but she's also jealous of it. It means she will not be a prisoner like her mother. Gladys wants Chell as far away from Aperture as possible. She continues. Goodbye, my only friend. Oh, did you think I meant you? That would be funny if it weren't so sad. It sounds sarcastic, but break it down. Gladys is in pain. She knows she's losing the only person there who mattered to her and her last connection to being Carolyn. She's literally saying it's sad, but also trying to disguise her pain by insulting Jell. It's a very common and very human defense mechanism. Gladys sings, Well, you have been replaced. I don't need anyone now. When I delete you, maybe I'll stop feeling so bad. Gladys is saying that the only way she can be rid of her connection to Chell is through deleting her memory of her. She is admitting that she's hurting and that she's striving to repress her feelings. Go make some new disaster. That's what I'm 
This is almost stereotypically parental in nature. If you take out the sass, you could be a very loving parent, remarking on their penchant for making messes, or being chaotic in youth. It could also be twinged with regret and pain. She couldn't take care of her daughter, and was in fact terribly abusive to her as Gladys and kept her in a very dangerous environment. Now she knows that she isn't fit to keep her. It's like a scene from a movie where someone is letting an animal go because they know it belongs in the wild and will ultimately be happier and healthier there. But the animal won't leave, so the person tries to scare it or yell at it to make it leave. Furthermore, Gladys repeats the line, that's what I'm counting on, quite a bit. If we look at each line that comes before, that's what I'm counting on, we get, you want your freedom? Take it. You've got your short, sad life left. Go make some new disaster. The theme of all three lines is Chell is alive and free. Gladys is counting on Chell's will to live. One of the more emotionally gratifying parts of the game occurs after Waitley is making fun of Chell. He ridicules her for being adopted. And he calls her fat. Gladys defends Chell and comforts her, saying, What exactly is wrong with being adopted? Also, look at her, you moron. She's not fat. When I played, that part actually made me emotional. Gladys, who had spent so much time berating Jell is now coming to her emotional aid. It's symbolic of friendship, protectiveness, and it felt akin to the kind of relationship that one might have with family members. Family will often pick on each other, but once someone else takes a jab, one family member may fiercely step in to shield the other from harm, like mother bears protecting their cubs. In this moment, we have Gladys' acceptance, and I don't know about anyone else who has played, but I didn't realize I wanted that acceptance till that moment in the game, and when I got it, it felt really, really empowering. I don't know if that was something expertly crafted by the game makers, or if it was my own personal feelings about my sister, who I am crazy protective of in real life. But that part of the game is one of the most memorable for me. Perhaps the most touching scene comes at the end of Portal 2. Gladys rescues Jill, and upon finding her still alive, says, Oh, thank God you're all right. That is pure Carolyn right there. An AI has no need to reference any god, especially in a facility where she is, for all intents and purposes, a god herself. Then she says, you know, being Carolyn taught me a valuable lesson. I thought 
Going back to what I said earlier about Gladys viewing the humans in Aperture as her murderers and then realizing that she was Carolyn and realizing who Chell was, I believe this statement holds a lot more emotional weight other than a changed opinion. I believe that's Gladys's way of saying I know who we are. There is a part at the end that strikes me as funny, but it also makes me a little sad. It's one of those moments where you smile, but your heart hurts at the same time. After Gladys rescues Chill from space, she says, The surge of emotion that shot through me when I saved her life taught me an even more valuable lesson where Carolyn lives in my brain Goodbye, Carolyn And then she proceeds to make it look like she undergoes some sort of transformation However, I believe Gladys does not delete Carolyn I believe that she can't And I believe that the fact that she says goodbye, Carolyn, proves that Carolyn is still trapped inside Gladys. Earlier in the game, when we were hearing the recordings of Cave Johnson, he says, Say goodbye, Carolyn. To which Carolyn adorably answers, Goodbye, Carolyn. It was her joke to say goodbye to herself. So when Gladys says, Goodbye, Carolyn, it's Carolyn saying goodbye to herself again. But instead of being happy-go-lucky, she's sad. I believe she pretends to delete Carolyn as a coping mechanism of coming to terms with who she is, how she came to be where she is, and who Chell is. might also be a way for her to scare Chell into thinking that she's a threat to her again, so that she'll want to leave. She then says, You know, deleting Carolyn just now taught me a valuable lesson. The best solution to a problem. Hard. Just go. It's been fun. Don't come back. This skewers my heart. She's not trying to be mean to Chell. Killing her is hard. Not because of Chell's determination to live, but because she can't hurt her now that she knows the truth. She wants Chell to leave Aperture, and when Chell reaches the exit and is free from Aperture, Gladys throws out the companion cube from the first game. A lot of people interpret it says Gladys's final snarky joke, but I interpret it as I did in Portal 1. She is giving Jell her heart, because there is no place for it in Aperture. That is Gladys's final goodbye. I love you. Let's get into some metaphors and symbolism that pertain to themes outside of the portal verse. 
References to Greek mythology are pervasive throughout Portal 2. In one part of the game, you pick up a turret. It's different <laughs> from the other turrets in that it's not inclined to kill you. It wants to talk to you. And if you pay attention to what it says, you he will hear. was punished by the gods for giving the gift of knowledge to man. He was cast into the bowels of the earth and pecked by birds. It won't be enough. The answer is beneath us. Her name is Carolyn. Remember that. That's all I can In Greek mythology, Prometheus helped Zeus overthrow the Titans. The Titans were often personified by different elements found in nature that were out of the control of man. The ocean, the earth, the sky, the moon, and time. Though once an ally to Zeus, Prometheus was the champion and advocate of humans. And Prometheus was regarded as man's protector and worked secretly to help mankind in ways that Zeus did not condone. He was associated with science and intelligence. Zeus punished Prometheus by chaining him to a rock where his lover was eaten every day by an eagle due to his immortality. Yet, Prometheus was unendingly stubborn and would not submit to any of Zeus's inquiries despite the daily torture inflicted upon him. Carolyn is Prometheus. She helped Zeus, or Gabe Johnson, overthrow nature, also known as the Titans, via science. However, she did not have the same disregard for test subjects that Cave did. She is punished by being made immortal and imprisoned. And when she is potatoes, she is fed upon by crows. Furthermore, she is cast into the bowels of Aperture Science when she is overthrown by Wheatley and Joe. In one scene, if you look closely, you will see the word Tartarus written on one of the walls. In mythology, Tartarus was a place that those who were punished were sent, something that other religions might regard as hell. Since we know that Prometheus was perpetually tortured due to his immortality, it further reinforces my belief that Gladys was subconsciously trying to help Jell succeed so Jell could kill her later. Carolyn is chained to Aperture, and she wants her freedom. Another example of mythology is when we hear Cave Johnson in the recordings. He says, Great job, astronaut, or hero, and or Olympian. With your help, we're gonna change the world. Olympian is the word to note, since Olympians were the gods that lived on Olympus. If Carolyn is Prometheus, who was the benefactor of man, how can she be so vengeful 
against the people of Avatar. Well, Prometheus helped the Olympian gods overthrow the Titans. Since we are regarding nature as the Titans, we can look at the scientists in Aperture as the Olympians. Perhaps vengeful Carolyn as Gladys doesn't regard those she has held captive in Aperture as people. Maybe Carolyn's Prometheus is taking revenge on the Olympians she helped come to power. If we take a look at Prometheus's family, we find a couple siblings. In the co-op version of Portal 2, one of the characters is named Atlas. Atlas was Prometheus's brother. Prometheus also had a twin named Epimetheus. Epimetheus translates to afterthinker, while the name Prometheus translates to forethinker. Epimetheus was a fool, while Prometheus was intelligent. Perhaps Weekly is the Epimetheus to Carolyn's Prometheus. So who does that make Chell in the world of Metaphortal? Well, since she is paired with Wheatley for a good portion of the game, she could be representative of Pandora. Pandora was created by Hephaestus and Athena. Hephaestus was the god of craftsmen and artisans, and Athena was the goddess of wisdom, courage, and war strategy. Zeus ordered the creation of Pandora to punish Prometheus and mankind. Pandora was given to Epimetheus as a gift from the gods, and even though Prometheus warned him to be wary of Zeus and his offerings, Epimetheus accepted Pandora. Pandora goes on to open a very famous box. It was actually a jar and releases evil and sickness onto mankind, leaving only hope inside the box. So in this regard, Jell could be Pandora. She was Ratman's gift. She was allies with Wheelie. She opens Gladys and removes the AI from power. Therefore, the power over Aperture Science is Pandora's box. Both Gladys and Wheatley are markedly more homicidal and impose suffering and death on others when they are connected to Aperture. However, Chell might also be representative of Heracles also known as Hercules. Hercules rescues Prometheus from Zeus's punishment and saves Prometheus from the eagle. Jell helps Carolyn realize who she is and saves her from the crows who are pecking at her when she has potatoes. Hercules carried out 12 labors and Chell never stops going through trials. At the end of the game, Jell is released by Gladys into a field. In Greek mythology, the Elysian fields were the final resting place of heroes. It was a paradisiacal afterlife. So perhaps Chell is Hercules, finishing her trials and descending to Elysium. I 
can't say for sure who Chell is. And I think that's because the game really isn't about her. Even though she is the protagonist. It's about Gladys. The only thing we concretely know about Chell via the game is that she is, quote, stubborn and never, ever gives up. Features that were characteristic of Prometheus. Perhaps those attributes were passed down to her by her mother. So that's it. Like I said, there are other theories about the games that include that Chell is a clone, or that Chell is dead, and that the companion cubes have the bodies of the subjects in them, but I don't subscribe to them. There is some evidence that suggests they could be true, but not enough for me. And I feel like if they were true, it would sort of minimize the emotional arc of the story. I can't say for certain if they are right or wrong. I have no idea if my own theories are spot on or spot off, but I think that's part of what makes this game series so awesome. Different things in it resonate with different people. Do you have any theories? Thank you for watching, and I will see you soon in a new video. Good night. Sleep well. Bye. Hello there. Wasn't that inspiring? Today is a day of scientific exploration. And aren't you a lucky duck? You didn't get put in the mantis group. Let me see your ID necklace, hun. Thanks. Okay, you're approved. That means I get to give you a nice little stamp on your hand. As if you were going clubbing. Hold out your hand for me, hun. There. And that's just so if there's any unforeseen circumstances, I'll just wave a nice little light over your hand, and I'll know which pile, group, I should put you in. Okay? Nothing to worry about. It's just silly protocol.